what is going down welcome to show me the meaning wise cracks movie podcast show me the volleyball <laughs> i was wondering what you were gonna say oh good so one. good what's what's up everybody i'm austin hayden and i am joined by the show me the meaning crew we've got raymond hey everybody how's it going and coming back to join us, we have Amanda. Oh, hey. Oh, hey. All right. So this week, we are going to be talking, uh, we're going to take a, a step back in time. You know, it's always hard for me to admit that we're going back in time to look at an old movie because this movie came out after I was born. But I guess the 80s is now considered old. Um, so we're going to be looking at an older movie. Top Gun, 1986, directed by Tony Scott, starring Tom Cruise, Kelly McGillis, Val Kilmer, Anthony Edwards, Tom Skerritt, Michael Ironside, Meg Ryan, and Tim Robbins is even in this film for a little bit, as well as Adrian Pastar and many, many others. Um, So this was obviously a huge kind of commercial hit. Uh, it was at the peak of, of kind of launching Tom Cruise into the stratosphere with superstardom. So there's lots and lots and lots to talk about. There's also some interesting political stuff that we can get into that I know for a fact that Raymond is going to want to bring up. Um, oh, so we'll know. definitely be able to get into that. <laughs> we'll get into that as well. Uh, but first, let's go around and do first impressions. Let's talk about what was it like the first time we saw this film? How many times have we seen it on repeated viewings, if any? And then maybe what was it like to revisit it this most recent time? Let's start with Amanda. Amanda, what is your experience with the old Top Gun? Okay, I'm such a wild card here because I somehow had not seen this film until today at 10 a.m. No, so oh, wow, wow. I just, I don't know, I don't even know why. Um, but yeah, so this was completely my first time seeing it. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's fun. I feel like it's like, a, it's like a really good ad for the Navy mm-hmm. and a really good it's ad for Tom Bruce's abs. The <laughs> so mm-hmm. there's that. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, but um, I mean, yeah, it's it's an it's an okay <laughs> time. I'm 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 a little bit like meh, to be honest. Okay. Um, all right, all right. Had you had you had familiarity with it in, in like terms of pop cultural references and stuff like that? You just had never gotten around to actually seeing it, or were you totally blind? Like you were like, I know nothing about this. Okay, this is so embarrassing, but it made me finally realize why Archer always says "danger zone." Um, <laughs> I'm like okay. a cultural idiot. <laughs> No, no, this is great. This is great. You got to always fill in those kind of like background gaps a little bit. So that's great. Okay, Raymond, what about you, brother? Um, I had mentioned to you off uh, off air or um, uh, off mic, as it were, that this movie to me is just one of those things that's like, even if you haven't seen it, you've seen it. Maybe kind of touching on what you had uh, alluded to there, Amanda. Like this movie looms so large in popular culture. Mm-hmm. It's the movie yeah. that launched Tom Cruise into the stratosphere. Um, such a huge hit. The soundtrack is incredible. There's all this yeah. stuff that it's it's just out there. I, I feel the need, the need for speed. Like you you know the quotes. Yeah. You you know the the vibe of it, even if you haven't seen it. And yeah. I don't know that I ever had watched it. You know start to finish until fairly recently maybe in the past few years but i feel like i had seen it a hundred times just flipping through Mm -hmm. tv and stuff and and i mentioned to you austin that it is maybe only second to footloose as the perfect background movie you just (laughs) it's got a great soundtrack it's got a great look to it phenomenal photography a lot of fun scenes some good action to tune into uh Mm. a uh, a romance story that the editors affectionately refer to as the B plot. Um, just <laughs> e- everything that exists on the ground. I think the movie is comfortable with you kind of, you know, tuning out because as soon as they take to the skies, it's it's pretty impressive. Uh, and uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, this 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 movie is, like Amanda said, I think it may be a little underwhelming if you're going into it expecting an all-time classic. Um, but it's really good at what it's trying to do. And I think what it's trying to do yeah. is be a, a fun summer romp at the movies uh, and also <laughs> wonderful a wonderful recruiting commercial for the Navy. <laughs> that's, that's also <laughs> something it's good at doing. But um, yeah, I, yeah. Uh, I, I enjoy this movie a lot. It's, uh, it's a really fun time. 
Yeah, I love it. There's even a poster in the locker room at one point that says something like, you know, U.S. Navy, it's not a job, it's an adventure. It's an adventure. I I caught that. It's an adventure. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and I believe that actually there are metrics that show that after this film was released that the enlistment numbers went up substantially they, they had was, recruiters no they had recruiters in theater lobbies for this yeah like, oh that because that's not sinister like, oh yeah i mean like we don't we don't want to get too much into all that stuff but i mean the the navy subsidized a lot of it they had to like work yeah you know hand in glove with them they had to approve certain aspects of the script they made a lot of changes to the script to make sure that the navy was comfortable with how they were portrayed and you know there, there's yeah. a lot of that stuff that we could uh, we could dig into but it may, it may get dark pretty quickly <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, So it's tough for me. I I tweeted out, I said, look, we're going to be talking about my all time favorite movie on this week's podcast. And someone someone tweeted like, yeah, I love that movie, but all time favorite. There are irrational loves that we have in our lives, right? Like there are things that you love because you loved them as a child. And this was the movie like this came out when I was like a baby. But there are films that just are a part of your upbringing. My grandpa was a fighter pilot. He flew uh, he flew for the Marines, but he spent some time down in Miramar doing some training. Uh, he worked with the Blue Angels. And actually the guy that plays Perry, the friend that Charlie meets in the bar, um, his name's like Captain Pettigrew or something or Colonel Pettigrew or something Pete, like that. Pete but Pettigrew. he's actually a friend. Yeah, he's actually a friend, was a friend of my grandpa. So, like, I grew up with, like, in in a ridiculous close relationship to this film. I have seen this film, Karate Kid and The Princess Bride, more than anything that I have consumed. Those three were, like, those are my childhood. Add that with a little Saved by the Bell and then in high school, Dawson's Creek. And that basically explains why I am the way that I am, <laughs> uh, for better or for worse, Okay. Um, and then throw in some pop punk music in there as well. And so here we go. So I have an irrational attachment to this film. So I've gone through various phases. because I've seen it so many times. And then I've gone through the adult phase where I'm like, okay, I'm going to be critical. I'm going to put my thinking cap on and I'm going to watch this film with a critical eye. And then I'm like, okay, I can criticize it. That's fine. But last night I was like, I'm just going to watch it and I'm going to try to see what I get from it. And you know what? It's a fucking good movie. It is fun. <laughs> it moves. There's it's it's lean. It's like long-ish. You know, it's like an hour and 50 minutes, but it fucking moves. Um it is slick. The action se- sequences are are shot so well. I was paying attention to every frame. Every frame even even when it's just dialogue frames, they're so full. The background, the way that the setting, um the way that the camera moves at certain moments, not too frenetically like Michael Bay, like I think I, I, I was joking to Raymond and I said that Tony Scott is the Martin Scorsese of Michael Bay's. And what I meant by that is that is that he's a craftsman, but while still doing the slick commercial thing. And I was really, really trying to kind of like hone in on the direction and the production last night, um, rather than just getting caught up in the emotion of the story and like take my breath away and all that stuff. And you know what? It may not be a great movie. Like my favorite movie, 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 movie is Wings of Desire. That's a movie that sticks with Take me. Take a drink that I think at is, home, is, folks. Is a fr- you mentioned Wings of Desire. Yeah. <laughs> Von Trier's coming soon. Um, but but to that but 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 in terms of like this being just like a well crafted piece of of moving imagery, it is, and it is a commercial in feature length form, but. Fuck if it's not well done. So that's kind of my thoughts on this now, and it will forever have a place in my heart. So, okay, before we start tearing it apart and getting into the critical side or praising certain elements, let's quickly do a recap for people, uh, especially if they're like Amanda and they have never actually seen the film and they only know maybe little bits about it. So, so basically, this is the story. were raised in like Amish land. <laughs> <laughs> and let's just be clear. This is a film that is rather light on story, okay? But uh, I'm going to do my best to try to to try to try to put some narrative together here. But so U.S. Naval aviator Maverick and his radar intercept officer, that's Rio, Goose, they encounter two hostile MiG-28s in the opening scene. They scare them off, but not before one of the MiGs frightens another pilot, Cougar. Now, just so you know, a MiG is a Russian or Soviet um, model of a plane. Okay. Uh, now when they get back to the aircraft carrier, Cougar, the pilot that was scared by the MiGs, uh, turns in his wings and he quits, which leaves Maverick and Goose in the spot selected to attend the prestigious Top Gun Flight School. So Maverick and Goose head to Miramar in Southern California. 
Now, one night in a bar, Maverick meets Charlie and attempts to hook up with her on the premises to win a bet with Goose. She shoots him down, however, but then the next day in class, she turns up as being a civilian contractor who works for Top Gun. Now, during the lecture that she's giving, Maverick contradicts the information that she tells them about Miggs and explains his close encounter with the two Miggs, and she's obviously impressed. Now, during the first training mission, Maverick and Goose defeat Instructor Jester by pulling an aggressive move and following Jester below the allotted hard deck, which is the um, elevation at which you're not supposed to go below. But it's also got a great name. And there's amazing sexual... You were not kidding about this summary. This fucker is dragging. (laughs) I told you, I told you. Okay, now they celebrate after they beat Jester... But they're warned by the head of Top Gun. Here, I'm going to I'm gonna make it really exciting. But they're warned <laughs> by the head of Top Gun, Viper, that they broke the rules of engagement. And they're warned to shape up. While Maverick's main rival in Top Gun, Iceman, also confronts Maverick for being too dangerous. Now, Charlie also calls out Maverick in class for flying too aggressively. But then, you know, she later admits that she only said that in class because she was afraid that people would see right through her praise of his flying and realize <gasps> that she had fallen for him. And then we get the best sex scene ever filmed because, you know what, wait for it, it'll, it'll take your breath away. Now, during the final heat in the competition for the Top Gun Trophy, we have a head-to-head competition between Maverick and Goose squaring off against Iceman and Slider in positions one and two. Now, while Iceman fails to engage during this training exercise with the enemy plane, he breaks off, but Maverick flies through his jet wash, causing a flame out of both engines, going into an unrecoverable flat spin. So Maverick and Goose have to eject from the plane before it crashes into the Pacific. But Goose's ejector seat sends him into the canopy, and he dies. After Goose's death, Maverick nearly drops out of the Top Gun program, but when an international crisis arises, he is called upon. Back on the aircraft carrier, they're informed about a hostile situation that requires their engagement with enemy aircraft. After one plane is shot down... Maverick is then sent as the alert fighter, and he and Iceman, outmanned, take out the enemy craft. Now, after this whole affair, Maverick considers maybe becoming a Top Gun instructor, so he heads back to Southern California, where he runs into his old flame, Charlie, and they do some slick, flirty banter. The end. All right, before we get into the show, we got to give a quick shout out to our sponsor over at Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community where you can connect with other like-minded people and creatives and where you can explore projects that you are passionate about. This is why Skillshare is so cool because you can unleash your creativity and pursue your passions right from the convenience of your own home. Now, they offer thousands and thousands of classes for creative and curious people on topics such as iPhone photography, drone filming, editing, classes on improving productivity, video for IG, artivism, etc., etc. The one on improving productivity is one that I definitely uh, will return to frequently because this is my... I'm constantly, if you're stuck like I am between self-doubt and apathy, it can kind of kick the tires and light the fires a little bit for you. So I would definitely recommend checking that class out. So if you're interested in exploring your creativity and if you want to connect with some cool people, go to skillshare.com slash smtm. That's Skillshare.com slash SMTM, and you'll get a free trial of their premium membership. So that's Skillshare.com slash SMTM, or you can click the link in the show notes. All right. So, Raymond, why were you laughing at my synopsis? No, well, I mean, I think you know I was laughing at your <laughs> synopsis because you're afraid there's not enough meat on the bone here to get us to an hour. So you pull out the fucking Top Gun script and just start reading line for line what's happening. Um, no, I, uh, I think it was maybe- vaguely Wikipedia. <laughs> I think you're maybe giving your favorite movie short shrift here, Austin. I think there is a lot to talk about. Mm. Um, I agree. Uh, but I don't want to start it. No. <laughs> um, uh, I think this is hell. I'll start with something I really, really dig about this movie. Uh, on a script okay. level, because I don't think this movie's script gets enough credit in a weird way. That I know this is a very oversimplified, you know, just kind of actioner. They get those planes up there, they shoot it, and they see what happens. Um, 
but there there are some really which is what happened which is why they had to do reshoots because the yeah, studio sure. was basically Brooke, Bruckheimer was like yeah there's no story here like this is really <laughs> cool action stuff but we need some dialogue well that's why I mean you you mentioned the uh, the famous take my breath away sex scene or love scene as it were do you know the story behind shooting that no, tell me. I'm so, so curious. There's, I, yeah. Well, let me see how much I want to backtrack here. Have you ever heard the uh, the Quentin Tarantino rant from from Sleep with Me about how Top Gun is actually gay propaganda and the whole movie is? Oh, about, it's completely homoerotic. Well, absolutely. Um, there, you know, even by Tony Scott's admission, one of his key visual influences for this was Bruce Weber, who was a a, a photographer of a lot of homoerotic tableau. Um, and when he showed some of that visual inspiration to uh, Jerry Bruckheimer, they got really cold feet on the project. And he <laughs> he even said like this whole movie was so difficult for him to crack because he had only done The Hunger up to that point, which is this very sleek, sexy vampire movie with, you know, David Bowie and Catherine Deneuve. Mm. It's one of my favorite movies. And he said that his sort of key into understanding Top Gun and how he wanted to shoot the film was just treat these guys like rock stars, treat them as treat them as gods, mm. oil them up, make them look as beautiful as possible. <laughs> and the thing that actually got him the job for this was that he was the only director who had who had uh, experience filming jets on his reel. He had done a Saab commercial where the a Saab jet commercial, was yeah. flying over a car. So um, there's, what what the hell was I, uh, was I gonna say? <laughs> oh, so the thing with Kelly McGillis, and this is something that Tarantino brings up in his, uh, his rant about how this is actually uh, gay propaganda, that they don't actually hook up until she's dressed like a guy, that she's wearing like the jacket and the baseball cap and the elevator. Well, that was because right, right. the movie had been shot, it was in the can, Kelly McGillis went off and got a new haircut, Tom Cruise was off making, I think, The Color of Money. So his hair is all slicked back to hide the fact that it's changed as well. And in the gay propaganda version of this movie, the story is, well, he's not attracted to her until she's dressed like a guy. But in the real version of it, they literally had like one day to shoot that elevator scene. And then they had to go across town to shoot them in the you know apartment or whatever set that was where they the, the director of photography said he had time to turn on one light and then they just go in there. It's just like lit however it is. It's kind of silhouette but it looks really, really good. It's nice and subtle. And I, I will say one, one thing on the editing side of this when they were mixing it, because they said they got that scene literally days before they had to lock the film to start sending out to theaters. Um, it is so crazy to me how they make you wait for the lyrics and take my breath away in this movie. They start playing that song four fucking times before you even <laughs> before you even get to the lyrics. And it's just, it's one of those things that's like, it reminds me of MacGruber where he has the sex scene with, uh, with uh, Kristen Wiig and it's set to take these broken wings. And then he goes off into the cemetery because he's grieving his dead wife. And then he has sex with her ghost and they play the same exact song. They do the same exact sequence of shots with her. And it's just one of those things where like, they had to have had Top Gun on the mind because this movie mm. is so, I love, I love how it starts. Like it's just teasing you with that take my breath away. It knows how much you want it. It started to feel like when, like, a cell phone keeps ringing, like, at a restaurant, and it's not yours, <laughs> and they have, like, a ringtone. I was like, wait, am I going crazy, or is this take my breath away? But why aren't they singing? That is, so, that is really funny. <laughs> I, I, do, I do give them credit for, like, they, they put this stuff together on the fly. They were, you know, if you'll pardon the, the, the expression, they were building the plane while flying it. And there mm. is there is kind of a magic to how it came together. And one of the things I, I started off saying that I, I want to compliment the script on is that you you mentioned that a, a Rio is a, 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 a radar intercept officer. And I love that they never explain that in the movie. They There are so mm. many movies that deal with the military or that deal with just any anything, whether it's technology, whatever, where when they use the kind of verbiage or lingo that the characters would organically use, there's always a character who stops and goes, oh yeah, your radar intercept officer, how's he doing, blah, blah, blah. Right. Mm -hmm. I love that this movie just, they're embedded with, I mean, this is, you know, the, the upside of making a movie with such close collaboration with these professionals and the people who do this for, mm. for a living is that they have, you know, a, a great, a great, um, 
uh, advisors on staff, people who can kind of keep them on the straight and narrow with regards to what is and is not authentic. And then, of course, this movie throws all of that out the window because at the end of the day, it's like, well, we want to see these planes close to each other despite the fact that, like, real aerial combat maneuvering, you would never be able to capture two planes in the same frame. It's, mm -hmm. But, yeah. you know, it's, it, it's, it's that thing of... Uh, it, it, uh, never, never letting the truth get in the way of a good story. You know, this is um, mm. it's it's good filmmaking, it, even if it's not totally authentic. It's uh, it's just great cinema. I think I, I heard one of the I was watching a, a documentary about it called uh, Danger Zone: The Making of Top Gun. It's it's a special feature on the Blu-ray, and they said that when they turned in the first print of the movie, that Jerry Bruckheimer was like, "This is just a fucking hour and a half long sunset, man. I don't know what to do." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's been like disparaged as a bunch of music videos, for sure. Like I saw, oh. I was re I was reading about, I was just reading how yeah. the other people reacted to it. Um, in preparation for this podcast, because uh, I'm a <laughs> diligent guest, and yeah, a lot of people like described it as like a bunch of music videos, which I do think is like unfair. Um, but yeah. Well, that's the interesting thing is I was trying to think as I was watching it, I was like. I was like, you know how a lot of times we'll, we were talking about this with, with Pulp Fiction. You were like, oh, it's an anthology film that's kind of like put together and then there's a story, you know, on the outside, but that it's kind of bitty for you, Raymond. And some, we had somebody else kind of write in and say something kind of similar. And, and I was trying to think, you know, sometimes people will say, oh, this is, oh, Napoleon Dynamite. It's just a series of sketches that is kind of thrown that. together. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of like, I was trying, I was wondering as I was watching this, because again, I, I was trying to be critical last night. I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to watch this with a critical eye. And I was like, oh, is it, is it just reducible to something like what Amanda was saying? Some of these critics have said, like, is it reducible to it just being uh, a handful of music videos with a couple action sequences throughout and then um, some sexy like romance and some friendship stuff. And you know what? Like, I was giving the film short shrift, but that's only because I'm kind of playing into some of the critiques that are already out there. I was watching this last night and I almost tweeted like a little bit ironically, but I think that this film is essentially a character study of mm. a person, right? And I think it's a really interesting character study, but told through this um, Navy commercial, right? <laughs> but it is... But it isn't. It is a character study, and there's a lot of interesting stuff about this guy who's dealing with his daddy issues, and he's got this friendship, and and then it's kind of like the world. He he is the centerpiece, but it is this like mm -hmm. gravitational piece around this guy, around this one figure. And if we really wanted to dig into it, there is some interesting stuff about like trauma, about even like someone who's in the military. Like, there's not a lot of like flag waving explicitly by the actors right now there's a little bit Iceman does say like whose side are you on right which is very much it's kind of like a but it's less about America it's more about aren't you on the side of your boys your partner that's why you never yeah. leave your wing playing man, with the boys baby right yeah that's right. I and actually so that's yeah, actually ahead, oh sorry Amanda. Yeah, no, no, no that's, my fa that's my favorite thing about the film actually is that like I don't feel like you see intense male friendships on screen very much like you see like mm. like you know what's colloquially like called a bromance where like two guys like to hang out and like hook up with chicks at this like <laughs> like like you know pick up chicks together but like their friendship was actually super deep and i was actually really it was actually very interesting to just like see male grief on screen after like mm. goose died spoiler um but yeah so i i, I thought that was really cool because you don't see that a lot like you don't sure. see men just being like like grieving over losing their buddies. I got a friend. Yeah, I got a friend. He's a poet. Oh, he's a poet and philosopher. And one of the things he talks a lot about is how a lot of times with male male relationships, man man relationships, it's like you just said, Amanda. It's either like broy, like let's go out and chase tail, or let's go out and be like, you know, kind of like dudes. Or it's like it has to be homosexual. And he mm -hmm. talks about how there's not a lot of homosocial stories, like homosociality. And he says, and what does that mean? It's it's like male-male friendships that are intense and loving. And I was talking about this with a friend of mine the other day. Like my friends and I, 
now my guy friends and I, we now say like, I love you to each other when we talk to each other. I love you and I miss you. But that's because we're in our 30s now and it's we, we are at a point in our own maturity and, and comfortability with each other. And maybe there's just like the social tide so we don't feel the pressures. Whereas when we were in our 20s, it was always like, all right, bro, cool. You know, here's a, here's a fist bump and a high five and ooh, I'll catch you later. We'll go get fucked up next weekend or whatever. But now it's, it's there is a turning point in, in – and I think there is something – interesting about maturing into, for lack of a better term, like a, a homosocial relationship um, between between men that, that isn't often celebrated or explored or like maybe we don't even know how to do it that well. So there is something kind of interesting about that playing out on screen in front of us. Yeah. Yeah, Yash, it's also- uh, Yash Rivastava. Oh, sorry. Uh, I mean, no, go for it. Uh, I, I apologize if I uh, got your name wrong there, but he just uh, sounded off in the chat saying that Point Break is his favorite romantic movie. That's a, another good example of the the form. I think it is it is mm-hmm. an underserved kind of narrative structure. You don't see a lot of movies like that. And sorry, Catherine Andrew. Bigelow is greatly influenced by Tony Scott, oh, sure. and you can see. You can see Tony Scott's uh, influence looming large over Bigelow's filmography, you can, you especially can something like Point Break. And you can definitely see the influence of something like Top Gun, especially in uh, yes. The Hurt Locker. Um, mm. I think that movie, it's kind of similar to what you were saying, Austin, that while it paints a, maybe an unfairly uncomplicated portrait of the American military, that movie is weirdly kind of anti, not anti-patriotic, but it's... It, it, it's not like waving a flag or anything. It's just about a movie much, it, or excuse me, that movie is just about a guy much the same way that this movie is about a guy who really just seems to love doing this. And mm-hmm. and like, maybe we could talk about The Hurt Locker on a different episode, but there's a great scene in that where uh, they stop someone and they search his car and they don't find any weapons or bombs in it or anything. And they say, okay, he's not a terrorist. And then uh, Jeremy Renner says something to the effect of, well, you just made him one now because you're Mm -hmm. profiling him and blah, blah, blah. And there's just this kind of that line kind of clues you into his head that like, I don't know that this guy has like a a nationalist cause. It's just that he wants to be as close to death as possible. And you you see shades of Mm -hmm. Maverick in that where it's like and also just knowing Tom Cruise off screen is an absolute psycho adrenaline junkie. Um (laughs) You can you can see that that like no he would just sign up with whoever would let him fly around in one of these fucking things. It mm. is like interesting how like like I feel like some of the best movies about like like Austin was saying like homosocial relationships take place in the army because it's almost <laughs> like it's like a bat and actually I was reading I was just reading about Top Gun before the pod as I already said sorry not to brag um but no and so they they actually have a term like some scholars call it like a male melodrama which is mm. like like almost a contradiction because masculinity is so not associated with like deep emotionality and like vulnerability and stuff but yes. it's I feel like it's almost like when it takes place in a war context, it's like becomes safe, safer to like actually explore male vulnerability in some ways because it's like already hyper aggressive and masculine. And like what's nobody- the great analog and what's the great analog for war? Sports. And that's the other place where you see this. And you get a film like mm-hmm. Any Given Sunday, where it's it's an intentional war film but played out through an american football story and some of pacino's lines are very intentionally like battle battle related right mm-hmm. and so it's like those are like the two places where it's and then point break it that's that's a sport film right it's funny Even though that, it's it, yeah it's funny yeah. that you bring that up because the screenwriters said explicitly that they they wrote this movie as to them within like the framework of a sports movie. It's just that the sport oh, so happens to yeah. be aerial combat maneuvers. Um, yeah. But that's why like they, they pushed really hard to get a locker room scene in there. And any time that they would get pushback from the producer <laughs> saying like, why do you want a locker room scene? Why, you know, why, <laughs> why do we have to? And they're like, well, you know, it serves a few purposes. One. People want to see Tom Cruise with his shirt off. And two, we yeah. need to see these characters when they are not around their superiors. We need to see how they talk to each other, how they mm-hmm. interact. We need to see like their own kind of social hierarchy forming. And and that's the only way that like, I mean, sincerely, you know, having some limited experience with the military at boot camp, when I when when you're with your drill instructors, you have you're you're playing Simon Says the entire time. You have to do everything to the letter. Like there's a correct way to tie your shoes. There's a correct way to fucking make your bed. Like you spend an entire week just learning how to do that. Um, 
And then when they're not around and you have you have time to just like field day with people like you, you start to know each other on a more human level. And, and like you mm. do you do need those moments. And I think that is a testament to having some maybe it, it was having a military advisor on set that helped them bring those those moments out. Maybe it's just something those guys were naturally gravitating towards. But there is a framework to this movie that you don't expect because you just expect it to be the soundtrack. You just expect it to be the trailer. You know, when I think the last time I watched this movie was the first time I really watched it as an adult. And I was so shocked at how much of this is not in the air because you just, you, mm-hmm. all your memories of it are just this incredible flying footage. But then it is, it, yeah, you're, you're kind of surprised. Like they're doing something that is slightly subversive with this, whether you really want to want to admit it or not or want to enjoy it or not or if you feel guilty about enjoying it or not i don't Mm -hmm. know there's something to it i totally agree and i think it's really interesting that the first like when you see tom cruise mourning goose like he's like in tidy whities staring (laughs) in the mirror it's like almost I don't know. I like it, it, it that 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 choice was really interesting to me because it's both like uh it's like almost a little feminine but at mm. the same time he's like so hyper mask like you know hyper masculine and whatever. I don't know. It, it was just that was like that that scene was very interesting to me. Is what I was yeah, You know what I, I've I've wondered because the underwear they look like they've been worn. Let's just say that they're not a fresh pair of tidy whities <laughs> either. They're a little bit stretchy. You can see a little bit of shading of some crackage. And but I was I was thinking about it last night too. They're also really like there's they they cover a lot. And I'm like I'm so glad that I don't we don't wear those underwear anymore. Uh, that, <laughs> they're just not attractive at all. But I was like whatever. Um, but I even even that scene for some reason it struck me last night as well. There were a few scenes that really struck me last night. That one and then the Meg Ryan scene. Um, the when we first meet Meg. Yeah. Um, when She's we first exquisite. Meet her, she is exquisite playing this like Southern belle kind of like rowdy and she just injects um, a, a, another, a new type of energy. And I think what that does is, is not only does she inject the energy, but she also fleshes out Goose's character a little bit more. So then the stakes of the relationship between Maverick and Goose and that family become heightened even more. So now it's not just a military buddy. It's 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 a deep deep relationship, right? It's a it's a family, and the thing is, is that he never had a family, so he's chasing the ghost of his dead fallen father. That that's what drives him, and what drives him to be reckless is because he doesn't have anything to care about, right? He doesn't have mm-hmm. any stakes, so so he can do whatever the fuck he wants. Whereas Goose. Goose does. He has a family, and he says that at one point. He's like, I've got a family to take care yeah. of. And and I I just got chills. I'm getting chills talking about fucking Top Gun. Okay, so <laughs> Anthony Edwards Anthony Edwards is great in this, by the way. I think all the so acting is really good. Tom he is so great. Kilmer. Yeah, it's very well cast, but he has just that sort of like you know Tom Cruise has the movie star looks. Val Kilmer has the movie star looks. Anthony Edwards looks like a guy who's just a little off, and you have mm. to be just a little off to do this type of thing. Like it is so dangerous. Mm. You have to be so driven and so focused, but also have that sort of screw loose that you're willing to put yourself in danger for this sort of thing. And he he just has it in a in a subtle way that like I I don't think they draw too much attention to, but he's he's really good in the picture. Agreed. Yeah. Amanda, you when I mentioned the Meg Ryan thing, you you lit up. Did Oh my god, I just thought she was like honestly like the highlight of the film she was so fun yeah. she was so like funny and i totally agree with everything you're saying about like adding major stakes to um to the to the movie uh i always forget that she's in it so i i did too yeah. I, I i i forgot and then she comes in i'm like oh fuck meg ryan's in this i was like oh yeah yeah and it does it just it just injects a whole new uh, other layer yeah, you know, and there is something great about giving Tom Cruise that surround, like you said, having having some sort of stakes for him because this falls into the. I I don't know if y'all are aware of this, but early Tom Cruise, and you know to some degree later films as well, but this era of Tom Cruise movies, whether it's like Top Gun or Cocktail or Color of Money or uh, Days of Thunder, speaking of Tony Scott, 
every single one of these movies, Tom Cruise has the same sort of like uh, subversive take on the hero's journey, which mm. is that he starts as someone who is the absolute fucking best at a thing. <laughs> and then he, at some point, briefly doubts that he's the best. And then he's it's confirmed for him by even the naysayers, even the Icemen of the world, that yes, in fact, he is the fucking best at this thing. <laughs> and it also is just, oh, sorry. Oh, no, no, go ahead. I was also going to say, it's like so classically American that he's like, the reckless yeah. maverick, yeah, yeah. Like, oh yeah. like bad boy who needs to like be a little reined in, but not so reined in that he can't like do his excellence. Yeah, this this may as well be flying tigers with John yeah, yeah. Wayne it's it's the, the battle man. between the the id, it, it's pure id and his freedom to just be reckless and wild, but within the rules. Like, don't lose it. Like, don't don't become some sort of robot in automaton. We want you to still be the kind of larger than life, singular, free figure. But you know, can you figure out how to do that in a way that still, like, I don't know, serves your brother or your countrymen or the girl or whatever it is? Like, and then that's that's an impossible standard to live up to because I've been trying to do it ever since I first saw this film when I was, <laughs> you know, three years old or whatever it was. And yeah, thanks, Tony Scott. No, go ahead, Amanda. I do feel like the romance was like the most weirdly written romance I've ever seen. Like there was like you could not really draw a line of progression. Like first he like just openly propositions Mm. her for sex by singing with his buddies, which is insane already. It was almost campy. Like I would, I would argue it was. It, oh, I don't think so there's campy. any almost about it. Yeah, it's, it's okay. Over. Okay, it's, it's, it crosses. Yeah, the yeah. Campy, oh, yeah. Sure. As as as. Yeah, and as a test case for this, I used to do that in high school with my theater buddies. So, like, it was clearly, yes, like, yeah, yeah. How'd it go the first time? (laughs) Yeah, right. Uh, Crashed and burned the first time. How about the second? I'll tell you tomorrow. So <laughs> um, but it also was like, but then he's at her house and he like just leaves randomly and he keeps trying to shower. Because she's not dressed house. like a guy. It was just like, I don't, I, I, I was, I was, uh, I, okay. I kind of a little bit felt like it's how like an alien would write the awkward progression of like a very new semi relationship it's kind of it's kind of how aaron sorkin writes adult relationships is that they are just like high schoolers flirting he has no idea how adults talk to each other like (laughs) a man a man walks into the room in the very first episode of the west wing i i can't i can't get started on aaron sorkin but in the very first episode of the west wing like a guy walks into the room and allison janney slips and falls on the treadmill just eats shit and like gets rocketed into the wall and you're just like Oh, yeah, because she's never seen a dude before. It's just insanity. I but, mean, um, who among us? <laughs> there, there are, like, <laughs> hints of that in this where these these guys who are, you know, in some ways, they're, like, they're they're the Lost Boys. Like, they, they I mean, I'm sure they even kind of <laughs> get into this maybe in the sequel. I'm, you know, I'm eager to see what they do with it. Um, but Tom Cruise is the definition of that. He's someone That's who is... That's really good, actually, he's, yeah. He's boys. never stopped playing. Like that's that's why he's mm. still fucking. I mean, every one of these Mission Impossible movies. Now I think he's gonna do do like a low orbit jump for the next mission. <laughs> like it's just insane the stuff that this guy does. But it is. I think it is tied to this notion. If you watch the behind the scenes documentary from this movie, the first time that, uh, or not the first time, but on his, uh, there's one day where he he went up in an F-14 and the first time he vomited, he said the second time it, it, it was fine. And then by the third one, they're up, the sun is setting and they show footage of them coming back down. He gets out of the jet and it's just, I've you've never seen a brighter smile. It's like, he's just, he's just so mm. enraptured with it. And I'm sure a lot of people would have that response to it, but you can almost tell like, seeing the way that he lights up for his work like it, it it does seem really informative of where his career has gone now that he's like fucking 70 and clinging onto a plane or running across Burj Khalifa <laughs> like he's just I, I I saw in that in that documentary I remember thinking like seeing the smile on his face thinking like oh that's the Rosetta Stone right there like he has been chasing that smile and that that sense of of excitement ever since mm. Now, I'm not saying that the romance story is written well, but I just want to explore something for a second and see if this makes any sense. So 
the world that Tony Scott creates in Miramar, starting with the room where Viper is kind of giving them the brief. Uh, there's a lot of like sexual jokes. I think Hollywood turns to Wolfman at one point and says, you know, like this, I'm getting yeah, a hard on he or, does. this turns me yeah. on or whatever. And that's his, that's his, and he, and he says that multiple times throughout, right? Like at the end also when, when the MIG, when the MIGs are close, they're like, they must be close because I'm getting a hard on. So again, there's sexual references. And of course this is, dudes do talk like this, right? So, but there's like, there's a heightened sense of everyone's oiled up. You know, there's this like mood lighting. It's all these mm-hmm. sweaty, young, hot so men sweaty. in this room. And then Tom's. So sweaty and so oily, right? So then you get the bar scene. And the bar scene to me is like the release. But everyone there is there for the same reason, right? To have fun. Everyone there, all the girls that are dancing, all the guys that are there, it's like it's like it's positioned that, hey, we're all here to just give in to our passions and have a hedonistic moment. Except for Charlie. Charlie comes in and she's meeting with clearly somebody who is a part of the military who's a senior officer and they're having a business conversation so then the interesting thing is is it it's almost like it's almost like she allows herself because she resists the fraternization with that world right she stays above it because she's um, a government contractor and working for the pentagon or whatever but then she allows herself to kind of give in so if there is some sort of interesting arc He kind of also, I don't know if he has any arc. He just stays his charming self and gets the girl. But she kind of allows herself to come into that world a little bit and break her rules. And now I don't know if that makes any sense, but I think that's kind of at least one way of thinking about what happens. And and it's not really well developed, but it kind of is because... Remember, she kind of embarrasses him in class and basically says, oh, yeah, it was too aggressive. Why didn't you just do this? And he's like, well, if I did that, then this would have happened. And she's like, oh, I'm sorry. You know, it, yeah, it was a little bit aggressive. And I think we learned from this uh, exercise here today that, you know, you made the wrong decision. And then he gets all pissed off. And then she's kind of like, look, I fucking I want to break out of my role um, and kind of indulge in the passions. But I can't because I'm conflicted. Mm-hmm. And then she gives in. And then I think... I think if there's going to be some sort of synthesis at the end, the 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 when they can actually be together is when he becomes an instructor, right? And he's back in San Diego and now it's kind of like, okay, now he's not he's learned, he's learned to be a wingman, right? Like that's a big thing. He's learned to kind of like he can fly within the rules. He can kind of tame himself a little bit. He's not as much of a loose cannon. So he kind of grows a little bit. And it's not just pure hedonistic, impulsive, flying against ghosts. And then she's kind of like, okay, and I can kind of, I can, um, I can indulge in the passions a little bit and we can connect and we can kind of meet somewhere in the middle. I, I, I'm literally, I'm stretching this as far as possible, but I'm, I think there's but something my, there. I can't remember if I, I watched the first trailer for the new Top Gun a while ago, and maybe I'm just imagining this, but I think there is a line of dialogue in there where they're like, you should be an instructor by now. And the implication is that he's just like, no, I'm just, I'm just going to fucking fly until I die in this goddamn thing. <laughs> Which is exactly, yeah, I, I do exactly wonder. how you expect a Tom Cruise like, character to be doing this in a, a, a 40. Yeah, he's like 50. Yeah, and he's a, a sequel still a 40 boy. years later. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, okay, I definitely, I see what you're saying, Austin, and I would agree that she has more of a romantic arc than him because she, mainly because she starts out saying I would never date a student, and then she does because he's yeah. Tom Cruise. And she dates a student. Um, but yeah. she also, like, I don't know, I mean, I don't think she's, like, a great, a, a, a deeply drawn character. Like, she wants this job in DC so fucking bad, no. and she gets it, and then she comes back to play yeah. music on the jukebox, and yeah. you're like, this is so 80s. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, I, I, I mean, I feel like I, like, 25% agree with you. <laughs> There's, <laughs> there is a part of me that, that thinks, like, at some point when they were developing this script, they probably talked to the screenwriters, like, Hey, we got to get a girl in there to diffuse some of <laughs> yeah. this, all this tension and like <laughs> all the stuff that's going on. Uh, granted, you know, I think a lot of that comes through in the direction, you know, uh, to wit, Tony Scott was saying that when they shot the volleyball scene, the famous volleyball scene, that they went there. It was like the one scene that wasn't storyboarded within an inch of the within an inch of its life, and that the crew was like, "Okay, what are we shooting?" He's like, "What do you mean? What are we shooting? We're just gonna they're gonna play volleyball. We're gonna shoot a bunch of dudes, shoot, yeah, shirtless, just get them greased up, get the fucking neck going, and let's let's just start rolling, baby." 
Oh God! Um, imagine being the makeup artist having to grease. <laughs> that's so funny. Um, <laughs> getting to, but, not having to. Yeah, I mean, getting to. That's fair. There, there but is it, a <laughs> bit of their relationship that reeks of that kind of like fifties conceit, where yeah, uh, you know, oh, we we just met, but boy, oh boy, I think I'm falling for you, and uh, you know, I can't. Boy, yeah, oh it's, boy. it's just that there are so many of those. I think like the first War of the Worlds, you're watching it, and it's like Steve Steve McQueen and. Uh, yeah, sure enough, he's he's a hunk, but he's like way too old for that. He's like playing a high schooler in that movie, <laughs> and then he's like opposite another high schooler. Or no, that's not War of the Worlds. What am I thinking of? Um, at, at any rate, um, I'll I'll, uh, I'll get that one later. But it is just that common conceit. You guys are familiar with it, where it's like, well, we've known each other for two days, mm. but I've just got a feeling. I can then in the scene after she angry angry chases him away from the base, and then he jumps off his motorcycle. He's throwing his little tantrum, and she goes, "I just don't want them to know I'm falling for you." And I was like, "Why?" <laughs> like I know he's a hunk, but my God, he's being a baby right now. He really was. He's like he like he can't take. Like, if you can't take constructive criticism. Um, no, but also, I mean, I feel like, like, I don't think it was intentional to make the romance kind of not deep, but I do think it just underscores how, like, this movie is ultimately about, like, intense r- emotional relationships between men. Like, he yeah. certainly loves loves Agreed. Goose more than he could ever, you know, like, ever love a woman. <laughs> Like maybe not sexually, but just like like their their bond was so intense that that no, Charlie seems really like superficial. Like the, his relationship with Charlie seems super superficial in comparison. Yeah, it's a balm. It's a balm to cover over his daddy issues, yeah. right? Like the real. It really is like she, which is why he's not still. I mean, I I, I mean, I don't know if Jennifer Connelly is playing the Charlie character. I mean, maybe she is in the in the new film. But um, I get the idea that this relationship, like you can you can romanticize and be like, oh, it's going to last. I don't think it's going to last. It's just like an intense, passionate, um, heterosexual thing or fling yeah. or whatever. And that's fine. But the real crux of the relationships are Goose and Dead Father. Uh, I'm sorry, Maverick and Dead Father, Maverick and Goose, Maverick and Iceman, who then they kind of – they, they have a bond over, you know, learning to trust each other or whatever it is. Uh, Maverick and Tom Skerritt's character, Viper, right, who becomes a kind of surrogate father type of figure who knew his father. Those are the essential relationships in, in this film. And I do like what Raymond said is that the screenwriters talk about the romance as being the B plot. Well, they said they said like, anything like, on the ground is kind of the B plot. And I like I like what you're getting at. I think the, okay. the the relationship between Tom Cruise and Kelly McGillis would almost work better if they just didn't have her say that thing about falling for him. If it was just I agree. Clear- that that was mm. that was so fucking funny, yeah. I and, have oh, to say. By the way, anyone who's yelling at their fucking uh, phone right now because I got uh, that Steve McQueen movie wrong, it was the original blob I was thinking of. Sorry I messed that up. Um <laughs> But yeah, it would it would work a little bit better if it was just played for like, hey, you know, rules are made to be broken, and this this guy is a, a total hot shot, and <laughs> like, why not why not have a yeah. little bit of fun? But it's it's it, they're playing into the, this like grand romance of it, and it's like this movie's just not built to support that. With that said, the sex scene would not be as uh, as fantasized. If it were just like, uh, just simple passion, the fact that they inject the like, I've fallen for you kind of thing, it it almost like heightens it maybe to a point of like absurdity, yes. like, like something like, like a, a sex scene out of silk stockings. It is a little bit absurd and people laugh about it too. Cause also like the tongue kissing is, is something that they make fun oh of, right? God, in, what, in hot shots. I thought I was fun crazy. Of I was like that tongue moment, no, no. like it disturbed me, and I thought that I was like yeah, yeah. asexual or something. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh wait, is that what's hot? Is that what? Yeah, people want? and so is I'm what- so relieved to hear that people don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it has been not that there's anything wrong with being asexual. And- oh my god, that came out wrong. Um, it was just it was no, no, it no, was no, no, no. personally wait, 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 confusing it was for me. A moment. Exactly. No, we knew what you meant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and I think that they had to inject 
the capital R romance there mm -hmm. um, because the film is also really heightened and in, in it, it is a kind of myth. What did you say, Raymond? Like, don't let the truth get in the way sure. of a good story yeah. or something like that. Like, like this film is not in any way going for realism. It is fantasy. It is myth. It is imaginary. It is... Uh, you know, father-son drama. It is a uh, person-country drama. It is hero save the day drama. It is uh, prince and princess slay the dragon drama. Like yeah. it, it is. It is intentionally pitched a, at that level. A great level. example. And I think Tony Scott's actually really good. A great good example at that. of that yeah. is that they are having. They're having a class in a fucking airplane hangar. <laughs> like they have, they just have like this mobile chalkboard, this huge American yes. flag unfurled in the background when Kelly McGillis walks down the aisle and, and he realizes that she's one of the instructors at Top Gun. And that is one of those perfect moments. It's like, oh yeah, I mean, that there, there's absolutely no reason that they would be in there. And that's, they even pointed that out in the documentary that their, their advisor, Pete Pettigrew, uh, whose call sign actually was Viper, um, he, he said that on the day he told them like, you can't, you can't shoot this in here. Why would you have a class in a hangar? And they just told him like, cause it looks really cool. And then he said, you know, yeah. a, a year later when he finally saw the finished product, he's watching the movie. He's like, yeah, it does look really cool. <laughs> like, it's just, gotta give it to, him. to me, the most just like element to where this film was not aspiring for reality is that they never named who the enemy was. They just put like sure. a single red star yeah. on every plane. Yeah. <laughs> they were like, and and they and like they had so many opportunities to name who they were fighting, and they just did it. They were just, it was just like, and it really is. I feel like the whole film is. I mean, it it really fits the era because it's all about like fighting an enemy that like like borderline might not totally exist, <laughs> but like you have to be ready. And it is one know. of those things that yeah. Like, well, they so, don't so this, this actually goes end. to what oh, Raymond. Uh, I was just gonna say they don't acknowledge it all at the end yeah, yeah. that they have 100% sparked like a nuclear exchange with that final dog fight like the end of this movie would undoubtedly result in World War 3 but sorry go ahead right. yeah uh, it's so so just like a little bit of uh of info so again this goes to what Raymond was talking about how the screenwriters they don't um, you know, they don't explain like that Rio is a radar intercept officer. They don't explain that MiG-28 is a Russian slash Soviet plane. Yeah. But the name MiG is actually short for, and I, I'm going to butcher this, but it's uh, Mikoyan Garovich. And so it is a particular mm. plane that was manufactured. It was designed by um, the Design Bureau in the Soviet Union. So, and it's also made in 1986. So like... So it, people it was, knew. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think you know, like right now we're like, oh wait, what is, is that like, is that North Korea? Is it China? I mean, it, like, was, it was clearly Russia. It was just funny how they never like named it. Yeah. yeah, it yeah. Is, it, it, in the way, in the sort of gymnastics, the verbal gymnastics they have yeah. to do to get around name it, where they're like, the other side, the bad guys, the enemy, the, enemy, the blah, blah, blah. <laughs> the yeah, there's, there's like six or seven different euphemisms for And they like put Russians. it in the Indian, they put it like in the Indian Ocean, which just felt kind of yeah. random, I think, unless I don't know enough about world affairs, in which case, ignore me. No, they, they definitely, uh, I mean... Uh, um, America has people stationed absolutely everywhere, but Tony Scott, um, to kind of go back to his initial vision for this, he said that he wanted to do Apocalypse Now on uh, an aircraft carrier in the Indian Ocean, that he just wanted this mm. to be about like a dark night of the soul, that he wasn't in incredibly interested in in shooting the jets or anything. He just wanted to watch people like mentally deteriorating below decks. And they were like, yeah, that's not what we're doing, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> either, you either get on the train or you get on the tracks. Like this is the movie literally, we're making. Yeah, literally the men get like more hyped up with battle, I feel like. Well, except when obviously when Goose dies, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, no, definitely. I, I guess the last thing I just wanted to, to touch on, just because it's a perfect opportunity to touch on this. Um, this is the film that launched Tom Cruise to being a superstar, right? And we oftentimes talk now, and this is, you know, the mid 80s. We oftentimes talk now when we're talking about the film industry that the age of the star is over, mm -hmm. right? So can we just for briefly, just for a couple minutes, just to kind of close it out, what makes, one, what makes Tom Cruise a superstar? Like why him? Like there are plenty of good looking, charming people. What is it? that makes him the star, like makes him a star. And then what's the difference between someone being a star 
in this previous era and someone like Chris Hemsworth today or 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 Robert Downey Jr. or like is Meryl Streep is she a star like like what's the difference and um if we can just flesh that out a little bit what do we think sure uh I mean to answer the Tom Cruise part first I I, I'm genuinely fascinated with him just as a, a figure in cinema history because he is the definition of a movie star in some ways um and I think he he's just very very smart about how he approaches his work from a very like from very early on in his career he set out to make movies with directors whom he admired like regardless of he he wasn't someone who was chasing a hot script or this that or the other he would always go first for it do do i appreciate the director's work he was a huge fan of the hunger and when Mm. uh, tony scott got involved with this he was trying to figure out ways to like rise to that aesthetic he also is intensely focused he 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 is he's like laser focused on on what he's trying to do he understands that his job is to entertain first and i think that you can see that as a very clear through Mm. line in a lot of his work is that he he will risk life and limb to reward the audience and to entertain the audience and he's someone like if you look at the mission impossible franchise he, I think that was the first movie that he produced, and I, I think the Mission Impossible series is a great case study for Tom Cruise's career writ large because it's a it it is a series that he sought out to develop as his movie series that he could be the James Bond of rather than you know jumping from script to script, and then he would use sort of the peak or the valleys between the peaks of Mission Impossible to pursue you know smaller more niche things build some, you know, not necessarily indie credibility, although he did do a handful of smaller films uh, in the independent idiom, like Eyes Wide Shut, for example, or Magnolia. Magnolia, um, yeah. But all of the Mission Impossible movies are are him bringing people into this sort of blockbuster filmmaking tent who otherwise would not be. You know, maybe less so in the latter entries that have all been Christopher McQuarrie, um, who is very much sort of cemented in that space. But early on, it was, you know, Brian De Palma, um, uh, mm. uh, John, he, I think John Woo, one of his one of his first uh, American films, if if not his very first American film was Mission Impossible 2. J.J. Uh, Abrams was the, the third Mission Impossible. Like he was really smart about just seeking out people mm. whom he admires. And he's just great at managing his own career. I, I think that's one of the secrets to his success. Sorry for uh, my rant mm. there. Yeah. Any thoughts on this, Amanda? No. Yeah. That makes a ton of sense. Um, and I hadn't really thought about his career like that intensively. So no, that that totally checks out to me. I do also think that we're like, because there are just so many more famous people than there used mm. to be, like everybody now can like have a moment, but they like can't really have a decade or you can't like create your decade now. Because like, if you think about it, like everyone freaked out about Adam Driver for like two months. I was an OG fan from Girls, <laughs> but Love um, yeah, uh, but like it, it it wasn't like lasting. You know, he's like like he'll never be like a Tom Cruise. Like I I, I think you yeah. just can't have a Tom Cruise anymore, mm. no matter how intentional someone is about their career. But no, maybe that's Robert, Robert Dwayne Johnson Jr. is probably the closest oh, yeah. that yeah. we have to like a movie star. If you think of a movie star mm-hmm. as someone who can open a movie on their face and name, Robert yeah. Downey Jr. can't do that. Iron Man yeah. can do it, but Robert Downey Jr. cannot. You know, mm-hmm. uh, ask ask the fucking judge if you disagree. Um, yeah. But, you know, someone like Chris Evans, phenomenal actor. I really enjoy his work. But I don't know that Chris Evans is a movie star. I think Captain America is a movie star. When there's such a, mm-hmm. an overemphasis, these big tentpole movies have become these long franchise entries. I, I do think that the, the spotlight has shifted from the actor to the character. And mm-hmm. people don't really have a chance to cultivate a movie star persona the way that Tom Cruise did um, because they're so locked into this one character. Mm. Yeah, like the, it's like the, 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 the dictatorial ruler of like the IP. Like the IP is first, mm. I totally oh, agree sure. with that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well let's go ahead and wrap up the Top Gun discussion there and let's briefly just jump into the mailbag um, if you out there want to call in or write in and send us your thoughts, fight with us, debate with us, correct us, add anything, please do. You can call us at 1-213-534-8807. That's 1-213-534-8807. And you can leave us a voicemail. 
Or you can email us at movies at wisecrack.co. That's movies at wisecrack.co. Um, so I'm not going to play the voicemail, but we do have a request from Jarrell who requested that we do Bo Burnham's new comedy special, Inside. And Jarrell, I'm pretty sure we're going to do that. I, I think, are we going to maybe do that next, Raymond? Is that kind of what we're thinking? Uh, I'd be down. Yeah, people are talking about it. It just came out. So I, I think that'd be a good one. Yeah, so we'll have a little chat amongst the production team, but I do think that we will definitely be doing that. Obviously, on Wisecrack, we've made a video about Bo Burnham in the past that I had a hand in producing. So if you haven't seen that, go check that one out. It's I think it's really good, um, talking about kind of his comedy and how it's evolved and something about like post-postmodernism and the new sincerity and metamodernism and all these other buzzwords. But you can learn all about that by checking out the video on Wisecrack. And so I feel like we definitely will address Bo Burnham at some point. If it's not next, it'll it'll be in the, in, in the near future for sure. Um, but I will read one email from Jaunty who wrote us, uh, who wrote in about uh, Pulp Fiction and basically, the whole idea with uh, with this email was that Jaunty was just very happy that uh, Raymond kind of put words to his own or their own sentiment, I should say. So, hey, Wisecrack, longtime fan writing in for the first time here. I always thought I was crazy because Pulp Fiction never completely clicked with me. So it was refreshing and exciting to hear Raymond articulate some of the problems I have always had with the film. I really do think that the conflict between the more traditional humanist elements of the film with the cynical, comical elements at the expense of its human characters leave the film feeling not only cold, but in a weird tug of war with itself. And then on a completely different note, I was wondering if any of you guys have seen Brandon Cronenberg's Professor from last year. I'm a sucker for super conceptual sci-fi and body horror, and it has similar narrative ambition to Tenet, but approaches it with much more nuance and ambiguity in its scientific elements. Love to hear your thoughts on Possessor, not Professor. Possessor. I, was gonna, I was about Possessor. to say, I think they meant Possessor. <laughs> no, they said You've Possessor. You've got academia on the brain, as always. I, 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 that was, yeah, that was, that was me. Uh, Possessor. If we never get to cover it on the show, I will say that was one of my probably top three movies from last year. I loved it. Yeah, I have not seen it, but I am a Brandon uh, Cronenberg fan. So I really loved Antiviral. Yeah. yeah, so. I'd be down to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Amanda, have you seen Pulp Fiction? Of course. Actually, it's kind of funny. The first time I saw it was like in college and I just like pulled it up on YouTube because I had no subscriptions back then. <laughs> and I accidentally watched a compilation of it in sequential order. Oh, I was oh. going to guess. Yeah. I, I know a lot of those so, are floating around out there. Yeah. And it was, I was just kind of like, this is what People everyone's love talking this. about in film <laughs> school. Yeah. I was like so confused. Um, but then I watched it for real. I mean, I think it's, I think it's a great film, but I completely agree with Raymond and our lovely listener that it's not like, Emo there isn't a ton of emotional depth. I mean, I would argue almost in like most ter like he's it's it's not like emotional movies, and it can feel really cold. I think I think the Cohen. Mm. I mean, I love the Cohen brothers more than like anything, but like I think they also can feel a little cold. Sure. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Well, wonderful. So if you're listening out there and you want to chime in on any of these discussions, please call us 1-213-534-8807 or email us at movies at wisecrack.co. Before we get out of here, where can people find you on the internet, Amanda? Um, I'm always writing and editing Wisecrack films, and I tweet quarterly at, <laughs> at Amanda Shirker. Wonderful. Um, so yeah, that's me. And Raymond? Oh, you can find me uh, on Twitter and Letterboxd. I'm at Crematoria. And uh, happy Pride, everybody. Uh, it was kind of a fun yeah. coincidence that we did this homoerotic hunky movie here. But uh, we <laughs> this was not we did not intend this to be our like big Pride <laughs> episode. But happy Pride all the same. So uh, at any rate, if you want to swing by Twitter or Letterboxd, say hi. We can uh, talk about movies there. Sweet. And yeah, you can hit me up. Twitter, Austin underscore Hayden. Insta, A-U-S underscore H-A-Y got a youtube channel just search my name austin hayden got a podcast on philosophy called owls at dawn all the usual stuff raymond send us out of here send us into the danger zone oh man you threw me off and now i feel like i should sing uh, goodbye from miramar california <laughs> 